Welcome to the Three Wins Podcast presented by Legacy Advisory Partners. I'm your host, Sean Lydon. If you're new to the podcast, Legacy is an Atlanta-based financial services firm that believes that the key to unleashing your company's full potential is the Three Wins Framework. So, what exactly are the three wins? The starting point is the shareholder win. What does the business owner want to accomplish financially and by when? Second, the company win. What does the company need to achieve to support the owner's financial goals? And finally, the key leader win. How can the company help key employees reach their financial goals, which in turn will contribute to both the company and shareholder wins? The idea here is that when you pursue the shareholder, company, and key leader wins all in concert, you'll see a level of collaboration in your business that becomes a force multiplier to achieve breakthrough performance. The legacy team calls this dynamic the collaboration effect on profits. And in the Three Wins podcast, we help you discover and deploy the financial strategies and tools you need to put the collaboration effect on profits in motion in your business and in your personal financial life. So let's dive into this episode. Today, I'm with the executive team at Legacy Advisory Partners, and we're going to be talking about succession strategies for businesses. And that's because depending on the studies that you look at, anywhere from 60 to 75% of privately held companies don't have a succession plan in place in the event that the owner passes away, becomes disabled, or otherwise is unable to run the company. So we kick off today's conversation with this question. Why do so few business owners have a succession plan in place? From an entrepreneurial standpoint, they don't know these, uh, the the questions around what to do next. Mm-hmm. Because they've been for so long in the phase of we're building the business and actually getting it to a, to a point where it's profitable. We kind of made it through that phase and now it's been profitable for a while. They're just graduating into that question of, well, what, what do I do with this thing? Right. You know, or, or what if something happened to me? I don't have to worry about, well, it's not profitable anyway. Now that it's profitable, I got to worry about what happens to me and how do I, how do I deal with some of these things? So if some of it's just a natural progression. Um, Versus, you know, sometimes it is actually a distraction that's keeping them doing these things. So, yeah, and and I would imagine as well as an entrepreneur, you're wired to be an optimist, where you you see yourself as, you know, why would I think about the negative? Why would I think about me not running the business? So I I got to imagine that you've got to run counter to the way you tend to be wired when you're an entrepreneur. Is that something you would see? Well, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, you really have to kind of turn that around. It's really the most optimistic thing would be Mm -hmm. you create a business that can run, uh, without you Mm -hmm. and you've created something that's you've created. What's uh, what maybe initially is, you know, it's a, it's a, maybe a high paying job, but you turn it into more of passive investment. Mm. Well, then, 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 then there's no boundaries on what the business can be if it's not okay. limited to what you can do directly. Okay. So the resistance go, go ahead. On is, you know, the resistance often is, uh, is sometimes it is a, is, it's an ego thing. And, and mm-hmm. we've had different folks refer to themselves as a, as the wizard or, you know, that they, they're comfortable being the most important person. Right even though they don't, you know, they probably don't understand the, the uh, depreciation that, that uh, is forced upon the value of their company because they insist on being at the center of the circle. Okay. Sometimes it is a, it is a challenge to say, all right, you know, whether you like it or not, if this other alternative is what you want to realize, and this is the steps we're going to have to take uh, with you as the owner being in the center of the circle, moving them out so that we can help them, uh, look at the, look at the uh, plan holistically and put something in place that they really want to achieve from a legacy perspective. Now you talk about um, center of the circle. If you can kind of define what you mean by that. Yeah. Uh, so you can all jump add, in. go ahead, Mark. Sorry, I was just going to add one comment. You know, it is a shift in mindset that okay. you're talking about because for all these years, you know, they've, they've run the business from an entrepreneurial perspective 
Mm. But really for them to get the most value out of the business, they, they need to be, you know, less dependent in the business. Mm -hmm. So we always say for an owner, the more, you know, assets they can set aside to be financially independent, then the more flexibility they have at, you know, time of transition, you know, and, and really trying to carry on the legacy that they work so hard to create. And, and Mark, I think that ties into that, Russ, that question I was asking you was that center of the circle. Cause what Mark was talking about there is the aspect of it being dependent upon you, I guess, being the center of the business for it to operate properly. Is that what you were meaning? Um, Russ, in, in that yeah, regard, David, when you say David always uses the example of Tommy Lee Jones in the movie, The Fugitive. Okay. Harrison Ford, the plane has crashed. Harrison Ford is on the lamb and all of a sudden, you know, you see Tommy Lee Jones with yeah. all of his uh, U.S. Marshal uh, lieutenants around him. He's standing in the middle of the circle and he's giving everybody orders. Yeah. And nobody could do anything without him being there to tell them what to do. And so that's kind of the, the image that we share with folks of, hey, you know, you, you want to get to a point where them, the leaders as a team, are able to, uh, they may not fulfill the entire visionary role, but mm -hmm. they're able to come in and say, hey, what are the best practices and what are the best steps forward working as a team versus some, one single person being in the middle of that circle and everybody waiting Mm -hmm. until the, the owner has approved of the things that they're trying to do. So it, it, it takes away initiative. It takes away those different things mm -hmm. where you see, uh, which is, is what we try to get to this collaboration mm -hmm. effect. So okay. if somebody at the middle of the circle, the profits are only mm -hmm. ever going to grow as high as that person can stay at the middle of that circle okay. without the person there in, in, assuming the, in the, through the team coming together and collaborating at a high level, mm -hmm. we talk about the collaboration effect on profits. That's where we ultimately like to see our clients get to. Okay. Now let's, let's go into defining the terms that we're talking about here because we kicked off this conversation talking about succession planning. We've also used the term transition planning just to be clear, those mean the same thing. Is that correct? Succession and transition planning? They can. Uh, in, a, okay. in a larger company, when you talk about succession planning, you're talking about multi-tiered organizational charts. Okay. Where there's a succession plan for every role within the company so that you can go from a talent development standpoint okay. and a risk perspective, you're able to give people a path up that quote unquote corporate ladder, graduating to higher levels of responsibility and a plan for pushing those people through that system. So it's a great thing to have in place, very necessary. Otherwise talented people say, I don't see a path forward. I don't know where I'm headed from here until somebody just makes a decision and says, Hey, why don't you try this? Mm -hmm. so it's good to have a succession plan from a risk perspective. If for some reason, the higher you go, the more important those people are to the overall functioning of the system. If one of those people from a risk perspective, uh, something happens where they uh, leave the company or, or you know, uh, involuntarily they're separated from the company, sure. then you have a big void and you have to have people with that succession plan in place. You have people who have graduated and are ready to step into that next role. Okay. So it's a continuity succession uh, conversation where when we define transition, what we're talking about is both people through the organization, but primarily the owner, mm -hmm. transitioning the owner out and transitioning the non-owners into an owner, uh, either an owner mindedness from a leadership perspective and ultimately a, a, a true equity owner um, taking over that ownership role so that the owner, uh, current owner can realize the equity that they have in their company. Yeah. It, go ahead, it, Sean, that also applies, you know, even to sell to a third party. Uh, you know, we think that, that the important thing is for the entrepreneur to get out of the middle of the circle, empower a team that can run the company without him. Mm. And even if it's a sell to a third party, uh, you can align the leadership team with an event mm -hmm. by some type of a participation plan, long-term incentive plan, option plan, 
stock appreciation rights, different plans like that. But we think it's important to, uh, to get the word out to your leadership team. Any business has to prepare for an ultimate transition. Mm -hmm. And for us to do that well, I want to involve you in the process and I want you to be aligned with my interest as the current owner, assuming that person had owned all the shares. And that's you speaking as the owner to the leadership team. That's right. Saying, mm -hmm. Okay. Now you mentioned long-term transition plan. And in previous conversations, we talked about both short-term and long-term transition plans. If you all could define what, transit uh, what a short-term transition plan is what that looks like and then go into what the long-term transition plan looks like yeah mark you want to dive in on that one sure yeah i'll take a stab at the uh, the short-term piece you know the short-term transition one of the key elements you know is as a, a business owner making sure that you know, if something were to happen to them that they have some defensive measures in place. You know, one would be if they become sick or injured and couldn't work, you know, become disabled, that they have ad adequate disability coverage that can pay them their necessary income stream. Uh, also, you know, you know, there's you can set it up where you can try to realize some of the business value that that's there, uh, because if you're not able to work, you know, the the business may not. Have maybe it will operate without you. So that's a real key piece uh, to secure that. And then also, you know, looking at your life insurance coverage from a personal perspective, making sure your family's taken care of, but also factoring in, you know, what the business, you know, worth is. Um, something happens to you, you wanna make sure there's, there's money there as, as a key man element that comes back to the corporation that, you know, gives them some some capital to, to fund projects and, and the business to continue. And then uh, additional life insurance proceeds there that can help redeem the stock. Uh, maybe hopefully you have a leadership team that can take over and uh, that can be a part of the, the sales process to, you know, minimize the number, but it gets, gets the you know, family, the money they should, should receive from the business. And it gives the business, you know, uh, ownership shares to the other, other people in the organization. And uh, that's kind of making sure all those elements are in play are really key to the short term transition uh, of the organization. And, and a quick follow up on that you mentioned key person insurance. Uh, d define what that is and what, what, what that tends to cover. Sure. So key person is going to, you know, look at if you were to have, have to, if the person owner dies, mm -hmm. is going to come into the corporation is going to be the owner and beneficiary of the policy mm -hmm. that the life insurance proceeds comes back to the corporation. You know, they can use it to, if they have to hire somebody, you know, an interim C, CEO to come run the organization or, um, gives the, the company some capital to, you know, if times are tough without that leadership, you know, they've got some capital there to help fund the organization. But that's how um, that piece of it would work. Okay. Anything else on the short term transition plan that you should be keeping in mind? Uh, I think, uh, well, one part, and Russ, you might want to speak to the second part of this, but one is, is it's really important to zero in on uh, the ownership. You know, who owns the shares now? Who would own them in the event of a death or disability? Mm -hmm. And then the other part that Russ likes to focus on with our, our clients is, uh, is, is transferring the responsibilities you currently have. To, who's going to fulfill that role or what you've been doing? And Russ, you might talk about how we, what's the process for doing that? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, the, the, the emphasis is on getting the owners to acknowledge that they are owner operators versus simply just owners. Okay. So when you're, you're, uh, you know, when you're kind of talking through with owners about this, this idea, they 
are a little bit hesitant. You know, they, they still want to say, well, I'll always be here running the business. You know, that's, that's never, that's not going to happen, which mm -hmm. they know it is, but they're just getting used to the idea. Sure. Well, what we try to get them to focus on is, Hey, in the event of your death or disability tomorrow, we just kind of, we don't, we don't, you know, it could be any time, but just say it happened tomorrow. Describe for us what you do that only you do that makes the, the helps the company be successful. Hmm. And so with that little question, they start to think through, all right, well, here's some of the, the broad strokes. And then we say, well, that's good, but we need this to be an exhaustive list because we need to know. Hmm what makes this company successful that you personally are in charge of. And so it, it there's a, there's a continuum of answers. So yeah. to the degree that they assume that they are the wizard and everything happens according to their approval and, and recognize fully what everybody else does on the team or in the business, sure. you'll get an answer of, well, I kind of do everything. I, I touch, mm -hmm. I touch on everything. Right. You know, there's not really a lot that happens in the company without, me but then you've got some folks who are like well actually i've taken some time and i have delegated this area in this area in this area mm -hmm. and to the degree that they have actually delegated it versus they've delegated it and every now and again they come down and micromanage for you know an hour and then leave again right stir mm -hmm. up trouble and then leave again sure at least there's a continuum of, of, of perspectives on acknowledging that they they have responsibility in the firm mm -hmm. and that eventually someone will have to take that responsibility over and to the degree that they can successfully do that. Then we can start having the conversation of what would it be like just to own the company? Mm. What if you didn't have to do anything except receive distribution checks from the company. What would that be like? And so getting them to that point where we can kind of bridge that gap, creating that exhaustive list, building a timeline for who needs to take over what uh, responsibilities um, over that timeline. And then to, and while we assess the team, the leadership team, we're saying, all right, listen, there is no one here that can do that. Hmm. You got to plug that hole. You might not have to plug it today, but if something happened, then the company needs to be able to have the resources to go find someone who can fill that role or there need to be other alternative plans where a third party could come in and fill that from a, a you know, from a consulting standpoint or, you know, just work through those scenarios. And, and that's one of the biggest, that's probably the biggest psychological shift that we have to help guide our clients through. How do you help guide them through that? Cause I got to imagine just internally, psychologically, they may push, back on that because they find so much value in what they bring to the business. That was their baby. It wouldn't have started without them. So how do you help them make that shift in their head? The, the first step is theirs. If they're not willing to acknowledge that, then they're mm -hmm. probably not a great client for us. Sure. Ultimately what we'll do is we'll help them put a couple things together, mm -hmm. but the value that we could bring the table will not uh, be realized yeah. because they want to hold everything too close to the, to the vest. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are really the sad cases because they don't, they don't fully get a chance to uh, uh, envision their legacy the way it could be. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're, it's just one of those where they're suffering from one of the vices we talk about of greed or distraction, or just, you know, one of those things where they are, they're just, they're holding on too tight. So if yeah. they are willing to acknowledge Yes, I understand. I get it. Mm -hmm. Less of me is actually makes the company more valuable. Um, not that they're not that they're not going to have a role for a mm -hmm. long period of time if they want to. Right. But that at least we could create a plan around their role. Then, if they're willing to acknowledge that, then that's probably over half the battle. Okay. Yeah. Another way of thinking about this, Sean, too, is many most people. They have, they do a lot of things uh -huh. and, and they're really only a few things that they really enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. And so the positive thing is think, think it's the things that you don't really enjoy doing. And let's just, just say, move those off your plate, delegate those things away and only focus on your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are you gifted at? 
What do you in, what do you love doing? What could you do all day without getting tired? That's what you want to focus them on. Mm -hmm. So that's really a, a should free them up. And then over time, you know, as you delegate more and more away, the the, the final remaining thing uh, that the uh, owner can still bring to the table since they're the founder is asking the question, what's next for us? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the ultimate creativity right there that you bring back to your team to say, Hey, I've been thinking about this. What do you guys think? Yeah. It, it sounds like they're building that delegation muscle yeah. and as they're building it, and they're freeing themselves up, they start to see the possibilities. Right. Like, oh, wow. With this freed time, I can think more strategically about mm -hmm. the business. And that, that can kind of become the juice for them, something they can enjoy as long as they own it. But then it allows them to envision what it would be like if they looked at what's next. Yeah. yeah. So we we talked about short term transition plan. How many years does that cover? When you say short term versus when you're going to look at the long term transition plan, what is that kind of cut off time or threshold? There's a line of demarcation. Okay, and it's different for every single company. All right, in what happens is, is you get to a point where the short-term transition, if you don't have certain planning steps in place already, mm -hmm. if, if the company is inherently valuable, whether no matter who, you know, if it's a certain type of technology or it's got a certain patent or whatever it is, then that's a different story. But most companies, if it's entrepreneurial led, there's a lot of weight that, and value that goes into the uh, owner operating and leading. A lot of the relationships are there. Sure. And processes and that sort of thing. So if there's no short term plan in place that uh, has uh, planning components around death or disability in the short term, mm -hmm. then at that point, you're, you're kind of just sitting there saying, all right, we need to get these different things in place. Mm -hmm. Because if something were to happen to you before we get the, either the disability pieces in place, the buy sell, the leadership team built out, the delegation strategy, until we get this in place, then we've got some problems. We've, right. got, we've got some operational issues. It's probably going to end up being a wind down. We don't know how your family would, would fare after any of this would occur. So there's a lot of holes in, in what we call gaps in planning that we have to have to help them bridge. Hmm. So we put those different pieces in place. Once those pieces are in place to where we can say, if it happens tomorrow or in two years, either way, we're okay. We know the plan. We've got, we've got the different steps in place. People know what the plan is. Mm -hmm. Once we get to that point, that's where we call that, that line of demarcation where anything beyond that mm -hmm. are just extra years of the, of the owner owning the company and working in the company. Okay. Yeah. Another way to think about it, Sean, is that the shortest long-term transition plan is probably a minimum would be five years. Okay. So what the short-term transition plan does, it, it buys you some time until you can get all the pieces in the puzzle in place for, for the, for the five-year event. Okay. So the, the short-term is there to go, okay, something happens in the very near term. Yeah. Are, are we going to be okay? The business going to continue? Right. Yeah. And then that allows you to work out, okay, what are we looking at in the next five, 10 years from now? Yeah, right. Okay. Because typically, uh, whether it's an internal sale or an external sale, the purchaser is going to be looking at what's the present value of future cash flow. Mm -hmm. And it's probably over a five year period of time mm -hmm. or, or, or longer. So you know, that's why we, you know, typically it, we're having to kind of uh, stretch the minds of the entrepreneur to think beyond just this year and say, look, let's run it out over the next five years and see what could it be and okay. dream a little bit, knowing that it's going to uh, change somewhat based on the economic environment and so forth. Now let's look at both the short-term transition plan and long-term transition plan and starting with the short term, what are the, key components that should be included in it. Now, Mark, you had touched on some 
but if you can kind of outline what would make an effective short-term transition plan. Yeah, beyond the, the disability insurance that we talked about, you know, the key man life insurance that the uh, corporation is going to be the owner and beneficiary of. Okay. And then maybe some buy sell coverage, you know, um, having some formalized agree legal agreements is obviously a, a big piece to bind, you know, the actions that you want to transpire. Uh -huh. um, and then, you know, looking at you know, when you think about, we're trying to help the entrepreneurial uh, owner to look at the three wins. So, you know, from a shareholder perspective, you know, what are they trying to accomplish for themselves and their family? Mm -hmm. How does the corporation, you know, uh, get a win? And then how do their key executives get a win in this process of, you know, if they're helping grow the business, then they should be able to share in some of that success. So going back to the shareholder of helping them identify, you know, what do you need to be financially independent? Mm -hmm. What's the income, your lifestyle that you're, you're living now that you want to live and, five to 10 years, whatever that time frame that you've identified of, of wanting to be financially independent. And then looking at, you know, what are the current assets that you've set aside and your plan contributions and identifying, you know, is there a shortfall or a gap that we've talked about uh, that you need to close through distributions or through the sale of the business, you know, in the long-term transition. So those are key pieces of looking at on the short term of, all right, here's where we are today. Here's where we want to be. And how do we close that gap and start identifying that and, and putting steps to be a part of the, the longer term process. And you mentioned the three wins and one of those components was the key leader retention. And I would imagine that having a short term transition plan in place would be a huge factor in retaining your key leaders. Is that, is that something you guys are seeing or kind of expound on that? Yeah, I think when you're, you've identified your key leaders and, and they're part of the organization, uh -huh. you know, they want to know that if something were to happen to you, you know, what's going to happen to the business. So it's, it's not only the, the financial pieces or the, the products that you're putting in place, the disability and the key man coverage. But I think it's a key piece is the communication. Of, hmm. You know, this is the plan, having them, having the key leaders get buy-in of here's what we want to accomplish. Here's the win for you, you know, and here's the win for the company. Here's the win for my family. So everybody's kind of seeing, you think of it as kind of a spider web of, you know, there's sure. different pieces but taking a step back and see how it all fits together uh, is very important to, to have a successful outcome for all parties involved. Now, before we move on to the components of a long-term transition plan, anything else you all would, would add to, to what Marcus said? I just think the two go together. You know, the, the, you know, if you if you just focused exclusively on a long-term incentive plan, then they're going to ask the question, "Well, what happens if you don't make it till that time?" Okay. And if you just focus on the short term, then so well, what happens if you do live? I mean, so if the two go together, sure. and you know, you want to fill in all those pieces of the puzzle uh, for the win for the key leaders. Okay. Yeah, and, and with the right the. the the owners that we like to work with are the ones that are, they're paying attention to culture. Mm. And they, they are looking for uh, that uh, kind of Patrick Lencioni kind of person who's hungry, humble, and smart. Mm. And you know, the, the ideal team player. So those types of people, they're asking these questions. Well, what would happen? I wonder what would, you know, I wonder what's in place if, you know, the, the owner passes away or the owner, you know, something happened. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what, what would happen? Cause they're thinking ahead. Those yes. types of people think ahead. They ask these types of questions. Mm -hmm. And so typically it's, it's, it's an easier job because, you know, they're interested in what this looks like. And they're not interested sure. from a career standpoint. They're, they may be ambitious to the point where, yeah, I could see myself, you know, buying the company if there was an opportunity or, you know, being able to lead at a higher level if the, mm -hmm. if the 
speed arose. So the fact that you're just asking the questions, getting the owners to ask the questions, mm-hmm. know which ones are, are to be prioritized first, and then putting a plan together and back to the statistic that we opened up this conversation with, having a discussion and a plan that's written out and communicated. It may not be perfect and there may be some time mm-hmm. in different events that have to happen before it's able to grow into the long-term transition plan that we want it to. Simply having one written down and communicated to the necessary parties mm-hmm. is monumental in, in one of the hardest things. And that's why you see so few companies actually get it done. I want to park on this for a second. So who should be involved in these conversations with the short term transition planning? Who, who, who's in the room to ensure that this is cover that this plan covers all the bases and will be as effective as possible? Yeah, the, the, the folks that we work as, a, as you know, the, the financial planning advisory uh, mm-hmm. kind of playing that role from, you know, that's what, that's what legacy does. Uh, the, the other people on the advisory team for the owner are the CPA, someone who knows and understands the tax strategy, mm-hmm. uh, someone from a legal perspective, an attorney who can handle these different types of discussions um, from a, uh, a business planning perspective, making sure that the intentions are reflected in the legal documents. Um, and then from time to time, you'll have, you know, different people who weigh in uh, from an estate perspective, if it's a little more complicated uh, in, in how they want certain things to be set up. But uh, those are the, the main components that we, that we want to see around the table so that it, from an advisory perspective, it's a collaborative effort yeah. Uh, okay. In, in making sure that it, the, the needs of the particular owner are customized in the result. Yeah. Another part of that is we we think it makes sense uh, for as the owner is is kind of envisioning the three wins: his mm-hmm. uh, the shareholder win, company win, and the key leader win. Before <laughs> he gets too far along, on we think maybe somewhere in the seventy to eighty percent. You need to start floating. You need to involve the leadership team in that conversation to get buying in. You don't want to have it all the details worked out and impose it on them. You want to invite their thinking and strategic perspective on that. Mm. Uh, for yeah. I think that, that's when you really get the buy-in. So that's the threshold, about a 75, 80% of the way yeah. there. Not early on in the process where you haven't, thought through yeah what's most important to you on the shareholder side but after you've got it pretty well formulated but you're not closed-minded still you there's some opportunity to to flex yeah Yeah. usually yeah the the leadership team will round out the perspective and make Mm -hmm. it a better a better plan than it would have you to take it all the way uh by yourself yeah probably the the not the final piece, but definitely uh, a, a, a group that needs to weigh in uh, is the family mm-hmm. of the owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, 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 in different ways, if it's a young family, that's a little bit different, obviously. But, um, you know, if it's an older, uh, if, if it's an older family, especially if uh, the family's working in the business, you know, there's, there's uh, different uh, elements of family, closely held family owned businesses that uh, you got to have that buy-in. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't mandate things in this situation for it to be a true success. Um, you got to, you got to give the right people the the opportunity to influence and buy in. Okay. Um, but again, we start with the shareholder win first. Sure. So that's the thing. If you, if you are the shareholder, um, you know, we want to coach you in how to make sure that win is maximized in the right way. Uh, not just dollars, not just dollars, but the whole experience for everyone um, so that it's a win all the way across the board. Okay. Now, we, we talked about the short-term transition plan being that immediate stopgap to buy you time to develop the long-term transition plan. And Mark talked about the key components that would make for an effective short-term transition plan. Mm-hmm. What are the key components that would make for 
the effective long-term transition plan? What are the key things that uh, uh, business owners need to have in mind to, to questions answered and so forth? Yeah. So I think the, I think the, the short term, everything we've already talked about fits into the long term. Okay. It's one of those where, and you get to a point where, you know, you can, you can look back and say, all right, we've got our short term details in place. And as we go through this long term, if death or disability occurs, we can hit the fast forward button. Okay. And, you know, the, the key to the long term is the what if. Okay. So, you know, I've got three locations in the Atlanta area, but man, you know what? I really see some promise in Nashville or mm -hmm. Birmingham or, you know, wherever it is, or mm -hmm. I'm in, you know, uh, two or three states along the East coast, but I, I really want to move a little more, more Midwest okay. yeah. an expansion goal. Or maybe I'm, I'm at, you know, I'm probably at 50% of, of the market share that I could probably capture. And I really want to capture that other 50%. I'm not sure how to do it. Okay. So you want to get all the plans in place for the short term questions it, and those could apply assuming the business is, you know, just booming and doing really well and making plenty of money and all those different things. You still need those planning, you know, steps in place to ensure the company continue to continue, uh, continue to thrive beyond the owner. Mm -hmm. The long term is the what if, what do we really want to see here? What's the vision? Is it a courageous vision? And do I have the right people around me? And the difference is the long term is time. Mm. Time to be able to accumulate. If I'm the shareholder, accumulate. Time to be able to, to, to scope out a vision, to, to say, hey, what could we really accomplish here? And developing the people around you to fulfill that vision and identifying the, yeah. the gaps in your team and going and recruiting and, and bringing those people in to help uh, make that thing possible. So th that's really the difference of time and having the opportunity to create yeah. that. If. Show this might be a good time to talk about tools in the toolbox for the long-term yes. transition plan. Yeah. Uh, one would be the five year model or five to seven year model projecting okay. going forward. And, um, and then in that we have an IBIT budget uh, of how the money would be allocated we, we can, can determine some level of distributions. And then and we can just offer, real quick, when you say EBIT budget, if you could define. That's a, a earnings before income tax, um, interest, uh, before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, EBITDA budget, or just the pre-tax income is what okay. you're trying uh, to get to. Profitability Got before it. we pay Uncle Sam. Got it. Okay. And um, so you're, you're, we're trying to say, all right, what can the distributions look like? And then how would that impact the valuation of the company? Hmm. And so once you have that five-year model, then the five-year model is what is what is the basis for defining the three wins. Because what you'll do is you'll say, all right, from, a, from a, uh, the win for the shareholders, the financial independence snapshot that takes into account current investments in place. And Matt can maybe talk about what the snapshot looks like. Um, but, but getting that built out is a big part of it. Uh, and then, um, the other thing then is, okay, well then what's the win for the shareholders developing the long-term incentive plan. Okay. And then ultimately you're thinking, well, what's, what's the most likely option as far as, uh, transition of ownership? Is it going to be, uh, an inside sale to management? Is it going to be gifting to children or a combination of gifting and, and, and selling, or is it going to be a sale to a third party or is it going to be an ESOP? So those are the, those are the options you start thinking about, but the fundamentals of the, of, of the collaboration effect on profit really applies whatever the transition option ends up being. Okay. And Matt, do you want to di dive into that snapshot? Tell us, can you give me an idea of what that is and, and what's covered in that? Yeah. So, you know, the, the business owner, they're a person too. Mm -hmm. They've got a family. Generally they have, you know, income that's coming in outside of the business. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost the same process just with a little bit different mindset as far as uh, putting together the snapshot. So just like you would look at the EBITDA budget 
for the business, you mm -hmm. want to look at, you know, the budgeting for the household or the family or just the individual. Okay. So taking a look at um, the same conceptual things, what assets do you have that will help, um, you know, bridge the gap in a short term or long term type okay. situation? If you're the primary breadwinner and, uh, you know, you get disabled or you die and that income stops, then what happens? How does the family mm -hmm. kind of persevere? Okay. So the, the same concepts and, and that's why it's such a, uh, a great, tool being able to look at these two things and you can make a lot of comparisons of um, a lot of times the the business owner will just think of you know the business that's their baby mm -hmm. that's what they poured kind of their heart and soul in for years mm -hmm. well we need to take these same uh, best practices and concepts and kind of get our house in order as well mm -hmm. so uh, really just uh, making sure that we are collecting all the data considering all the, the sources and everything that we have, mm -hmm. get a picture of where we are, draw out what our goals and kind of our long-term mm -hmm. looks like. And, you know, very similar process of just making okay. sure we get from point A to point B. And okay. uh, we consider all the different uh, bumps on the road that could be there as well. Now, I'm, I'm curious, is there a certain point in the company's life, maybe it's a, rev a revenue number or a number of employees where the owners should put both the short and long-term transition plans in place. Is there sort of that threshold or is this something they should be thinking about from the beginning? Kind of share, share with me your thoughts on that. I think they should be thinking about it from the very beginning. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. Any business, I think, has to kind of get beyond the survival stage. Mm, okay. Well, you know, if you're just scrambling uh, to make payroll and you're not really sure if you really have a business mm -hmm. that's going to continue, I think you have to get beyond the survival stage. And then if you're, you're in the early stage of the thriving stage, that's when you need to say, okay, we got to get this thing locked down, both from a short-term and long-term planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you don't have, if you're not sure you have something to pass on or to continue, <laughs> Um, yeah. that's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a struggle and there still can be some application there, mm -hmm. but, uh, just like if any person who's sitting there and saying, you know, what, what would happen if I couldn't do this job? Similarity is if you've got a startup business and it still, you know, hasn't really, uh, uh, reached that threshold of being a going concern, mm -hmm. still got a job, right? You're paying yourself to do, to work in that business. Hopefully you're paying yourself to work in that business. Sure. And so you still need those fundamental financial planning questions around uh, life insurance and disability. The only change is, is the business at a point where it can help me accumulate larger sums of cash than a sal a typical salary would mm -hmm. to impact my financial growth goals. Okay. And when it can, that's when you start to look at it and say, wow, there, there's something here. There's inherent value in the business that someone would be, would be interested in purchasing from me as an asset. How do I shore that up? How do I plan for its uh, maximizing the success with the business and ultimately, you know, doing something with it that creates a legacy for me and my family and, and is able to help me achieve the things that I want to achieve. That's when you start to feel a little bit different. Okay. Um, in regards to the extent of the short-term planning you need to do. Okay. Now let's talk about challenges involved with transition planning. I don't know what you guys see in business. Sometimes you'll see say in college football or whatnot, where there'll be a coach in waiting, you know, this assistant head coach who's supposed to be the one taking over and oftentimes that can lead to conflict and, and a whole sort of challenges involved, even though there was this clear succession plan. Yeah. So uh, do you see that kind of that dynamic operating in businesses? And what are some of the other challenges that you see when you're trying to implement a, a transition plan? Well, one of the key elements of a long-term transition plan is what Russ referred to earlier, the collaboration effect on profits. Okay. So whether that is, if it's a football team, the collaboration effect on winning. Okay. Um, 
And so there's two parts of that. One is there's the people part. Okay. And that's the culture part, the dynamic that we like to, we, we talk about the eight virtues that really end up improving the vision, the courageous vision, the engagement of the employees and their communication to create this collaboration effect on profits. Okay. And then there's the financial part where you're spelling out the goals, the targets. Okay. It's, uh, you know, if, if you don't have the targets spelled out and we haven't really taken into consideration the three wins, then you really don't have <clears throat> a game plan. Okay. It takes both to really have a long-term transition. The people part, which is the organizational development part, and then the financial part where you have these specific targets that you set that you update and we track our progress to mm -hmm. accomplishing those things. So the uh, breakdown would tend to be if you don't have one aspect involved, you don't have that synergy between yeah. culture and, and the business results. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the magic the is, is where the, if the owner sits there and he's ensuring he or she that they're ensuring their, uh, their win, they may be it, they may be winning at the cost of the business, and certainly at the cost of the other key leaders in the business. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 just a mindset of can I win? Yeah, you can win if you can figure out how to how to lead a profitable business. That's fine. You're winning financially, mm -hmm. but we're talking about a greater win in this situation. We're talking about the the idea of of paying it forward, passing it on to other people so they can continue to lead and. and you're thinking about all the other people that the business impacts mm. and if the business weren't there for some reason, what kind of hole would it be <clears throat> yeah. in people's lives? That's an important uh, uh, question that we want to make sure our clients are paying attention to. Cause if right. they're, they're saying, Hey, can, how can you help me rearrange all these things? I don't want to tell anybody in the business that I'm trying to do these things. I don't, I don't want anybody else to know. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. And I'm fearful that if they know they'll want something. Mm -hmm. that's that's the opposite of what we want to deal with because those situations never turn out the way that they should, that, that ultimately could if they were able to open up and embrace the collaborative uh need okay what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. john i think I, I think too the you know it, it's a we'd like to describe it as a continuum of okay you know it's not a set it and forget it you know you the, the, a lot of the pieces on the short term are kind of set it, those things lock into motion, you know, are there as protective for going forward into the long term transition. But, you know, it's something that you're going to continue to visit and update. Mm -hmm. So when there are bumps in the road, you know, the key is to, to have that courageous, you know, uh, vision and, and, you know, open communication with your, your leaders within your company that you can work through issues and, and, you know, you're continuing to update, you know, your, your leaders are, right, how are we, how are we progressing towards the, the benchmarks and the goals that we, we set forth? Yeah. I think the more that you communicate along the way, the, um, you decrease the, the likelihood of, of things going astray and, and, um, venturing off the path, um, and just keeping the, the lines of communication open. Sean, one, one thing to keep in mind, you know, most of our focus here on the short term and long term transition plan is dealing with privately held companies that are maybe the smaller, uh, the smaller end of the scale. Mm -hmm. But we think we think the three wins and you mentioned er, Russ mentioned earlier succession planning really applies to large companies too. We work with companies on the institutional side of our practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they maybe have 15, 20,000 employees. Mm -hmm. So it, it, different set of problems, but still you have to address any kind of uh, executive benefit or retirement benefit uh, that you're trying to say, we want to improve the engagement and retention of our employees. Mm -hmm. You have to still ask the, the, the same three questions because ultimately the company is, is exist for the benefit of customers. Mm -hmm. So you can't just, we can't, can't just think of, about, just the shareholder, we got to think about the shareholder. We have to think about the company. Then we have to think about the leadership within the company it includes really all the employees. What are the wins? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we are burning, burning through a lot of people, 
are, are overworking our people. They're not mm -hmm. using their giftedness. Mm -hmm. And it's just grinding through people to get to a bottom line number. That's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to really ultimately have uh, a great company. And that's a big problem in some of the larger companies. And ultimately, leads to the downfall of some, once we're very large, profitable companies, they don't consider the sustainability of the three wins for the benefit of their customer. That leads to their demise. Mm -hmm. So we like to always at least think about whether it's a benefit question about for the executive deferred compensation plan or the design of their 401k plan or something to do with some of the kind of other types of executive benefits or group life insurance or group disability. What are the three wins? How's this going to benefit the customer? How is this going to benefit the shareholder, the company, and then ultimately the employees? Yeah, and having the balance between uh, having kind of the short term addressed as far as your quarterly or annual goals, being yeah. able to accomplish those without forgetting about the long term. Uh, vision or success that you know really drives you to the level that you want to be and it, it feels like nowadays the bigger a company gets um, the less that they are worried about kind of that long-term mm -hmm. sustainability they're more fo focused on the quarterly you know numbers the uh, quarterly income reports okay. that come out and you know they're willing to mortgage the future basically to hit uh, the numbers in the short yeah. term. Mm. So you got to have a balance between the two and understand that uh, sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll lose in the near term because you're uh, investing to long-term success. Now, before we close out our conversation today, I'm curious, <laughs> Legacy Advisory Partners is a privately held company and I imagine you all have had to work through your transition planning just as you, as you talk with clients. Kind of walk me through what, what you guys have wrestled with in terms of your story. That's a great question. And what, the saying we like to uh, say among ourselves is we have to drink our own Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Got to practice what you preach. So, so we have, yeah, we work very diligently on uh, those things. We have a short-term transition plan in place. Mm -hmm. We have the funding mechanisms in place, life insurance, disability income. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got the role optimization, MITs at work. Uh, we've got the, the five-year model that we're working with. So all the things that we're really bringing to the market for our clients, we're really, we've seen the benefit of ourselves. So that gives us conviction to say, you know what? We've seen how this works. We've seen the collaboration effect on profits mm -hmm. and to create a really sustainable model that can grow beyond the founder. So we, we have a conviction about it. What kind of challenges have you all wrestled with when it comes to that? Well, I do think sometimes uh, when you think about the vision question, you're always trying to balance risk and reward. Mm -hmm. Should we invest in this? Should we spend this money here or not spend this money? Is it the right timing? And there's always going to be a level of risk and you don't want to be foolish about, about some of these things. So you have to have a good balance in the team of, you know, let's get out there and have the big vision, be overly optimistic. Somebody on the team probably needs to say, Hey, wait a second. Can we really do this? Is this reasonable? Can we really accomplish this target or is there a better way? And having some of those, uh, I think fierce conversations or, you know, authentic uh, disagreements that result in some type of uh, uh, consensus at the end is the way to go. Uh, but, but, but I think um, it do ultimately does take a courageous vision because it's, it's, you're going to have to assume a certain level of risk. And I think it's kind of like the Stockdale principle mentioned in Good to Great that we talked about many years ago. He said, you know, mm -hmm. knowing that one, you will ultimately prevail regardless of the difficulties you're going to have to face mm -hmm. as a group. Yeah. Any? Go, go ahead, Russ. Yeah, I, I think the, the, at the end of the day, uh, the, the reason that, that 
uh, the work that legacy that we provide our client, the reason that we're needed because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And what we talk about is the fact that you're, you're typically going to do this one time. Mm -hmm. You're not, it, it's not something where you, you know, you created and you continue to do it over and over. And over. I mean, you, you update it on the annual basis. You look at your short-term plan, your long-term plan and say, Hey, what things have changed? But the, the, all of the emotions and the things that go along with some of these uh, psych from the psychological perspective of opening up as the owner, inviting other people into certain parts of the conversation, uh, pulling the curtain back and, and letting people see some of the finer details of the finance, mm -hmm. and things like that, welcoming other thoughts and opinions into the decision making process. All of that is it. You just, you don't do it a lot, right? You're working on running your business and that's not, that's not what you think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So mm -hmm. you need someone to help you go through that. And you're typically only going to do it once. So you want to make it sure it's right the first time. And so when we, that's, that's because we have also uh, gone through the majority of it. We're in that long-term phase where we're waiting on certain things to, to develop and give time to it and growth questions and, so you, we're working hours out now versus the planning stage of it. Mm -hmm. When you go through that, there's a level of uh, not just an authoritative voice and, and perspective we can bring. So these are the best practices, but there's a level of empathy. Mm. We're going to be able to say, hey, this is hey, this isn't easy. We, un we get it. This is not easy. This is not easy. This is what you're going through, but you can, we're going to make it. Through. It's a discussion. It's collaboration. We're going to make it through. And it's a part of the journey of, of pulling these different things, these planning steps together. Well, you know, another part of this, Sean, is you think about the strategic plan. You start, you start, you start going out five years, and you say, well, "How are we going to do that?" It was hard enough just to get where we are now. How, can we <laughs> keep doing this? Sure. And, and what what happens is though is that you have these surprise insights that come to you, mm. and sometimes it's strategic. Uh, sometimes it's from a, just a tax planning. Uh, sometimes we, we, we discover some things that we can do um, from a tax planning standpoint that make it much more efficient for the business owner to be able to extract their equity out on a tax favored basis. Sure. Well, that's a game changer. Uh -huh. But you don't know all those things when you start down the road. Discoveries are made as you go along. Absolutely. Now, in terms of closing remarks, is there anything important that we haven't talked about today that you think uh, would be essential for our audience to know about when it comes to transition planning? Well, one thing that we were talking with uh, a business owner yesterday, this is really one of our clients from many years ago mm -hmm. who had um, developed a really nice business and he had identified a young person as a, a successor and we helped them, got with the attorney, worked out a transition plan for them. Before the transition plan could be realized, he became, he had a stroke, was disabled. Mm. Um, but the, now the business is thriving beyond him. And so the part that we started thinking about was think about the impact of that. Mm. You know, you think if a business is really focused on a, the customer, de de delivering a quality experience to the customer, and then the employees are winning. They're not too, you know, they have a healthy lifestyle. They're able to aspire towards some of their financial objectives. Mm -hmm. The company is able to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the shareholders able to win. I mean, that has so much good that happens. What better impact on the culture than a healthy business that is really trying to create these wins for everybody? It's, it's really an amazing good in in uh, our society mm -hmm. yeah excellent well excellent conversation y'all this has been been a lot of fun chatting with you on this thank you sean Appreciate thanks sean it. thanks so much Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about how to apply the three wins framework to your business, go to legacyadvisorypartners.com backslash the three wins. That's with the numeral three and download the free white paper, the three wins, how to unleash the collaboration effect on profits in your business. 
And I'll also have a link in the show notes for you. So until next time, see you then.